The savings and loan crisis of the late 1980s was, at the time, the greatest financial calamity to hit the United States since the Great Depression. A confluence of interest rate changes, well-intended government initiatives, and a deliberately lax regulatory environment combined into one of the largest bungles in the history of the U.S. government, which wound up costing taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars. Once all the dust settled, nearly half of the thrift institutions in the United States were gone, and the financial framework of the nation would be permanently altered. Most Americans in modern times know that the split between those who own their residences and those who rent them is about two-thirds to one-third. At the beginning of the Great Depression, however, these figures were reversed. Home ownership was seen as largely the venue of the solidly middle class and above, and only about a third of Americans owned their residence. The FDR administration sought to promote home ownership, and, as a result, also the home construction industry. What made purchasing a home difficult for most people was that mortgages were only five years in length, climaxing in a substantial balloon payment at the end, and these obligations were beyond the reach of the working man. The federal government established a number of agencies, notably the Federal Housing Administration, to facilitate a much larger market for mortgages, including a new class of instrument that had a term of up to 30 years. A 30-year fixed-rate mortgage represented a huge change in the real estate market, and millions of Americans, who would not have considered buying a home, could now weigh its benefits. At the conclusion of World War II, the market for homes and their attendant mortgages rose dramatically, and many working-class families turned to their local thrift institutions for mortgages. Thrifts, also known as Savings and Loan (SNL) organizations, had emerged from what was then known as the Building and Loan organizations of the late 18th century Britain. These early organizations were cooperatives, formed by neighbors as a means of pooling savings and making home loans available to their fellow neighbors. The goal of these cooperatives was not profit, but instead was seen as a means of promoting the cooperation, responsibility, and thrift of the working classes, as well as providing them a means to purchase their own living quarters. It was seen as a social good, not a money-making opportunity. America's own version of B&Ls grew slowly in the 19th century, but the Great Depression wiped out many of these institutions. After 1945, however, a surging middle class in America, coupled with a blossoming residential construction industry, provided fertile ground for the growth of U.S. thrifts. The business model of SNLs was simple. They acted as depositories for their members, and they used these funds for home mortgages for the same constituents. As with commercial banks, the deposits were backed by the federal government, Although the insurance organization was not the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, but the FSLIC, which stood for Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation. The cliché about SNL bankers was that they had a 363 business. That is, they would pay 3% on deposits, charge 6% on mortgages, and be on the golf course by 3 p.m. In order to attract depositors, thrifts would often engage in interest rate wars in which they would try to offer slightly superior rates than their competition. With both commercial banks and thrifts trying to outdo each other with respect to how much interest they were willing to pay depositors, the federal government put in place what would be the first element in the debacle that was to come. They enacted a law forbidding banks from offering rates over a certain amount. The interest rate wars were over and thrifts no longer had their principal differentiator to try to attract new deposits. Because of the growing popularity of the commercial paper and money markets, commercial banks were facing problems of their own attracting deposits. New opportunities for fixed income savers meant that commercial banks were less attractive, and these new vehicles pulled money away from both regular banks as well as thrifts. Because thrifts were very limited in what they could do with their deposits, they were also very vulnerable to changes in interest rates. For the 1950s and 1960s, this was largely irrelevant, but as inflation started to increase in the 1970s, the thrifts found themselves in a worrisome position. The practice of borrowing short to lend long meant that the revenue of the bank, interest from fixed rate mortgages, might not keep pace with expense, the interest paid out to depositors. The industry term for the situation was maturity mismatching, since the maturity difference between savings, very short term, and mortgages, 30 years, was so great. 
The Carter administration attempted to come to the aid of the banking business with the Depository Institution Deregulation and Monetary Control Act, DIDMCA, which, among other things, eliminated the ceiling on interest rates that banks were allowed to pay. This meant that banks could once again use interest rates as a way to compete for the finite pool of deposits in their market. In spite of the good intention of DIDMCA, it created a terrible situation for thrifts. The expense side of the ledger increased substantially, as banks were forced to pay higher interest rates not only to compete with other institutions, but also to keep pace with the exploding interest rates of the late 1970s and early 1980s. At the same time, the revenue side of the ledger was relatively stagnant. Indeed, adjustable rate mortgages were forbidden by federal law until 1981, which meant that the banks were forced to rely on old mortgages yielding 5% interest, irrespective of inflation or market interest rates. The spread between interest rates being paid for deposits and interest rates being charged for mortgages was the basis for banks to exist in the first place, since the difference in these rates was the bank's operating profit. In the interest rate environment of the early 1980s, however, this spread disappeared and went negative, yielding an average of negative 1.0% in 1981 and negative 0.7% in 1982. There was no way these businesses could sustain themselves, since they were paying more for money than they were taking in. In 1981 and 1982, SNLs collectively reported $9 billion in losses, and when assessed from an objective accounting standpoint, the entire industry was not only valueless, but actually had a negative net worth. What had once been a socially progressive effort to promote home ownership among the working classes now found itself as a multi-billion dollar debacle. By the federal laws and accounting standards of the time, what should have happened is for the government to shutter a large number of thrifts since the institutions were technically insolvent. The losses on customer deposits would have bankrupted the FSLIC, however and the bureaucrats in charge did not want to confront the disaster on their hands head-on. In addition, senior management at the big SNLs had a close relationship with their regulators, and government authorities failed to act as diligent executors of the regulations in place. Instead, federal regulators permitted banks to bridge the difference between their assets and their liabilities with a bookkeeping entry known as goodwill. This supposedly represented the value of the bank's expertise in a particular area of business. What it was in actuality was a thinly veiled accounting gimmick used to pretend that the firm was still solvent and that the books were in good order. The view from Washington, D.C. was that the SNL industry just needed time to heal itself within the framework of a less regulated environment. In fact, thrifts had been lightly regulated for decades, the interest rate cap notwithstanding, but with the passage of the DIDMCA and, in 1982, the Garn St. Germain Depository Institutions Act, the thrift industry was going to be operating in a complete different framework than before. Thrifts were now far more at liberty to do with their funds almost anything they chose. Whereas before they were confined to making residential home mortgages at fixed interest rates, now they could put money into commercial real estate, speculative land deals, new business ventures, and even junk bonds. Around the same time, major tax reform had been passed by Congress that provided generous tax benefits to real estate investors, making demand for loans, particularly for commercial real estate, surge. To ease financial pressure on the SNLs, regulators reduced the amount of funds that they had to keep on hand from their deposits. The rate had been 5%, but in November 1980 it was reduced to 4%, and in January 1982 yet again to 3%. This freed up substantially more capital for thrifts to lend, but also made them more vulnerable to downturns since they were effectively increasing their leverage. The anti-regulation philosophy of the Reagan administration led to the weakening of the already flaccid regulatory bodies dedicated to policing SNLs. Bank examiners from the federal government were poorly paid. The starting salary in 1983 was $14,000 per year and poorly trained. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board was also badly understaffed as well, so much so that hundreds of thrifts escaped even the most basic examination for years. Another relaxation in standards was the elimination of the 400 shareholder requirement for SNLs. In 
The genesis of thrifts had been the organization of hundreds of neighbors putting together a not-for-profit cooperative and using those deposits for home loans. By law, these cooperatives had to have at least 400 shareholders, 125 of whom had to be from the local community and no individual with more than 10% of the entire stake. The new regulations permitted ownership with as little as one owner, which made acquiring and controlling thrifts dramatically easier for people and companies that wanted to take advantage of the new environment. The entire philosophy of an SNL's being a community-based cooperative of neighbors was tossed onto the ash bin of history. The thrifts themselves also could now choose whether they wanted to be federally chartered or state chartered. Just as thrifts had been competing for deposits by offering increasingly tempting interest rates, now states began competing for thrifts themselves to set up shop in their state in order to benefit from the fees the banks would pay in to the state government. California, for example, passed the Nolan Bill in December 1982, which created a framework for thrifts that was even more liberal than the new federal rules. With this bill in place, California chartered SNLs would be permitted to invest up to 100% of their deposits in anything they wanted. For depositors, whether the bank was state or federally chartered made little difference, as their deposit was now insured for $100,000 by the federal government up from the $40,000 limit prior to Reagan's new laws. The moral hazard created by this situation is quite clear. Thrifts were now in a position to take in whatever deposits they wanted, with customers assured that nothing could possibly be lost up to $100,000 in an account, while at the same time the banks were permitted to use these funds in whatever venture, no matter how speculative, they desired. It became the ideal combination for any ambitious business person or charlatan since the source of funds had no fear of loss and the owner of the thrift could walk away from any potential disaster, confident that the federal government would make the depositors whole.